Well, today we're continuing the series that we've been in now for uh, the, the last four weeks or so called Scent Piercing the Darkness. And for those of you who are brand new, uh, I want to welcome you. This is actually the fourth mini-series in a longer-running series called Scent. Think of it like uh, the fourth season in a long-running TV drama. Uh, and, and the whole topic of Scent is based on a study of one of the most important books in the New Testament part of our Bible, uh, called uh, the book of Acts, and it's, it's, about, uh, it's a study of the movement of Jesus, kind of the rapid rise and expansion of the movement of Jesus after the resurrection of Jesus, shortly after that, uh, over the next 30 years as the movement expands over the Roman Empire. Now, uh, in this particular series, we've watched the last two weeks as one of the key leaders of the movement of Jesus. He's a man named Paul, we call him the Apostle Paul, uh, has recruited a new team to take the message of Jesus to areas surrounding the Aegean Sea. So you think of it as modern-day Turkey, Greece, that area. And so uh, we watched him as he launched off from a city called Antioch in an area called Syria. Uh, in fact, if you open up your note sheet and find the map and get oriented, you'll see on the right side you find Antioch about halfway up. This is the third largest city in the Roman Empire. It's where his home church is. So he starts with his team. They go north and then west, and they travel through, follow the arrows through Tarsus and Derby, Lystra, Iconium, Antioch of Pisidia, over to Troas. Last week we watched as they got on a ship and sailed across a couple days to the seaport of Neapolis, which served the major Roman city of Philippi, where they were arrested, imprisoned, and so on. We saw that last week. Well, today they're going to continue west on the Via Ignatia or Ignatia, uh, this was this major east-west thoroughfare, and they're going continue, to uh, continue west, and they're going to go through a couple cities. They're not going to stop and do ministry, but they're going to go through these cities you'll see on your map of Apollonia, uh, or Amphipolis and Apollonia. They're just about a day apart, so they're just going to travel for a day, stay at a Motel 6, uh, keep, on, <laughs> keep on going. Uh, but they're headed today to these two major cities of Thessalonica and Berea. So we're going to follow today, see what happens and so if you have your Bibles, I have your apps, just go ahead and open up, turn on to Acts chapter 17 as we break into a new chapter at the speed of light. All right, so Acts chapter 17 and verse 1. So Paul and his companions had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia. They came to Thessalonica where there was a Jewish synagogue. So a couple things. Um, Thessalonica was a major city. Uh, it's uh, on the seaboard there. It's a seaport. You can see it. It's still there today. It was called Thessaloniki now. In fact, Lynn and I were just there last fall as we kind of were touring these, these areas. And, uh, and so Thessalonica had about uh, two, 200,000 people at this time. So if you live in Simi, that's like um, 70,000 more than Simi, right? If you live in the San Fernando Valley, it's like 1.5 million less. All right. So... <laughs> They come in, it's actually the capital of the province, so it's uh, of Macedonia, so it's an important city. So they come in, and as normal, Paul and his team are going to start by going to the local Jewish synagogue. Now, whenever Paul would go to a synagogue, his message would always be the same. Basically, uh, Paul shared a couple of, as a, as a Jewish man, he shared a couple of assumptions with his Jewish audience, is what I mean. Number one is that he assumes that God has spoken to us through our history. That God has spoken to us uh, through Moses. He's spoken to us through the prophets. He's spoken to us through the writings, Psalms and Proverbs and so on. And so the Jews of the New Testament are the same, what we call today Old Testament, but it's their same scripture as their Bible that we'd have today. And so they believe God had spoken. That's number one. And number two, they believe that God had not stopped speaking, that he would continue to speak. In fact, in particular, the prophets and Moses and all, they'd said that one day, God would send a great king, the Messiah, and that he would finish this story that God had started with Moses and the prophets and so on. That if you think of it like a novel, like Moses and the prophets and the Psalms, they're all like the opening chapters of an incredible story, and that one day Messiah would come, and when Messiah would come, he would turn all wrongs to right, he would bring the kingdom of God as opposed to the kingdoms of man, he would, he would bring in the new heavens and the new earth, and that he would bring this final word of God, right? So they, he shared those assumptions that God has spoken and God will continue to speak. And so when he would go into his synagogue, basically what he'd say is God has spoken again, that he's spoken again through his son, Jesus. And so he would make the argument that, uh, first of all, we all believe in a Messiah. 
And he would say, let's open our Bibles. Of course, they didn't have Bibles like we have them, right? They had scrolls. Uh, they were very expensive, so you wouldn't have your own scroll. They didn't have apps on their phones. So, but he would say, let's open up the scrolls, and let's see what Moses said. Let's see what the prophet said. Let's see what the psalm said about the coming of Messiah. And so he would walk them through the Old Testament scriptures, okay? So he'd say, A is Messiah. B is the evidence of scripture of the life, the death, the resurrection of the Messiah. And then he'd say, now C, let me tell you about Jesus of Nazareth and how his life and death and resurrection fulfills these prophecies. So for some of you, you remember back in math, I can't remember what the property is or what the, the rule or principle is, but you know, some of you will remember this, uh, uh, all the A students. Um, you'll remember in math, there was this, uh, this kind of uh, theorem or whatever that A plus, if, if, if A equals B and B equals C, then what? All the A students, good job. Like, <laughs> I was like, I don't know. I don't know. A, B, C, D, that's all I remember. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so if A, if A equals B and B equals C, then A equals C. That is Paul's logic. If A is the Messiah and B are the prophecies, Messiah equals the prophecies, and then C is the life of Jesus, if A equals B and B equals C, then A equals C. Jesus is Messiah. It's very logical, right? So he's going to go in and he's going to unpack the scriptures. In fact, the term that Luke uses today is that he opened the scriptures and placed them before him. So that's what he's going to do. And so uh, we're going to see what happens. So in chapter 17 in verse uh, to the end of it, it says there's a Jewish, uh, verse 1, in, there's a Jewish synagogue. So as was his custom, that's what he always did, he goes to the synagogue, and on three Sabbath days, three Saturdays, he reasoned with them, very logical, from the scriptures. And he's explaining, and he's proving that Messiah, A, had to suffer and rise from the dead, B, and then this Jesus of Nazareth, I'm talking about, who fulfilled that, uh, he's the Messiah. He, he fulfills that. So A equals B, B equals C, then A equals C, all right? And he said, so some of the Jews uh, were persuaded. Not most, as we'll see, but some were persuaded, and they joined Paul and Silas. And I'm sure they started meeting during the week, studying the word, learning about Jesus, becoming Jesus followers, as did a large number of God-fearing Greeks. We've seen this in every synagogue. There are Jews, but they're also Gentiles who have not converted to Judaism, but they believe in the God of Israel. A lot of them came to Christ. And there's quite a few prominent women from the city of Thessalonica, okay? But other Jews were jealous. And so we've seen this throughout. This is the, Paul's first missionary journey. We've seen this, that often the Jews that don't believe get jealous of the influence Paul is having. And they also, also will feel like this is heresy and they need to stop it. And so they're going to resort to violence. Now, we saw this with the trial of Jesus. We saw it with the trial of Stephen. They can't win him fair and square in a debate. So they're going to go down to the marketplace, and they're going to get some thugs, Harley riders. You know what I'm talking about? Um, and oh, long hair, big beard. Sorry if that's you. Uh, <laughs> just kidding. I ride a Harley. Anyway, so uh, they're going to get some thugs, and uh, they're going to stir up a riot. Now, they've got to come up with charges. If they're going to take Paul and Silas to court, if they're going to try to get them thrown in prison, they have to come up with charges that will stick. Just like last week in Philippi, they had to come up with charges that would stick. So the charges this week is that Paul and Silas are committing high treason. And you say, well, how does that work? Well, remember what the message of Jesus is. Remember when Jesus came, what did he say? The kingdom of God is at hand. The whole message of Jesus in the Gospels is that this long-promised kingdom of God that Daniel was promised in his vision uh, about the kingdom of, that would come from God that would never end, but that, that kingdom through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus was coming. And so what do we believe as followers of Jesus? That Jesus came, he brought the kingdom, and through his death and resurrection, he inaugurated the kingdom through his cross. And so when we come to Jesus, we become part of the kingdom. What do we believe? We believe that when he ascended to the right hand of God, we saw this, remember in Acts 2, we learned this, that Jesus is King Jesus, Lord of all creation, that's why the early Christians would say, Caesar is not Lord, Jesus is Lord. And so there's a lot of king talk going on. In fact, remember, this is why Jesus was executed. Remember what the charge brought against him, the Roman governor Pilate, was that he claims to be king. 
Remember, that was the placard over his, why he died, king of the Jews. Uh, and so the accusation against Jesus was that high treason. They're making the same exact accusation against Paul and Silas. Very serious accusation because in the Roman Empire, coups happened all the time. As often as not, Caesars didn't just you know, accede to one another through legitimate means. Often it was warfare, coups, and so on. So very serious threat. So here's what's going to happen. They're going to go, they're going to create this mob. They're going to go looking for Paul and Silas. Now, they're going to assume that they're at the house of a recent convert named Jason. And just like last week, Lydia opened up her house for the church to meet in Philippi. It would appear that Jason has done that. So they're going to go there looking for Paul and Silas. But when they get there, Paul and Silas aren't there. Maybe they've heard they're coming. We don't know. But they're going to come, and they're, this mob is upset. So they're going to grab Jason the other Christ followers, and they're going to tear him out of their house, take him down to the Agora, to the marketplace where the courts would meet, and they're going to make their accusations. So let's see what happens. So uh, in verse 5, some Jews were jealous, and so they rounded up some bad characters from the marketplace. They formed a mob, started a riot in the city. They rushed to Jason's house in search of Paul and Silas in order to bring them out to the crowd. But when they didn't find them, they dragged Jason and some other believers before the city officials. And they said, these men who have caused trouble all over the world, think of the riots in Philippi last week, they've come here. And Jason has welcomed them into his house. He's harboring criminals. And they're defying Caesar's decrees. And they're saying, there's another king, one called Jesus. And so when they heard this, the crowd and the officials were thrown into turmoil. And they made Jason and the others post bond and let them go. So they're they're saying, all right, so Jason, we're going to put, you know, post like a bail bond. Um, and we believe that what's happening here is they tell Jason, basically, if Paul and, if you continue to harbor these guys, you're going to lose your money. And so Paul and Silas are like, it's time for them to leave. And so that night, under the cover of darkness, uh, the believers in verse 10 are going to get them out of the city and they go to Berea. Now, Berea is not on the Via Ignatia. It continues west. Uh, so they're going to get off this main interstate. They're going to go south. Uh, they're going to take another, and they're going to head towards Athens. They're going to head towards Berea, which is two days walk away, 50 miles away. And so when they get there, sure enough, what are they going to do? They're going to start sharing Jesus again. They're going to do normal thing. Go to the synagogue. Share the message. A, if A equals B, B equals C, A equals C. This time, however, a very different response by the Jews. The Jews in Thessalonica, not open. Their paradigm was set. The Jews in Berea, very open. Luke will refer to them as very noble-minded. Why? Because they're open to what he's saying. And what Luke says is they're going to examine the scriptures to see if what Paul is saying is true. Now, I want to do just a quick sidebar here. As followers of Jesus, this is what we should always do. You should never trust what I say because I say it. You should never trust what Dre says, especially. <laughs> no, uh, just because he says it. You should never trust what, you should never go on TV and trust what a pastor, or you read a book or whatever, you should never trust it just because someone says it. And especially when someone, something when is claiming to be from God and they're saying something that doesn't fit with what you've always heard taught from the word, especially then we need to go back to the word, open up our Bibles and say, all right, this is an interesting theory. Does it fit? And we need to go back and line up. And if it doesn't fit, we throw it out. Right? And otherwise, what happens is you have solid followers of Jesus who get way off track because they hear a teaching or they come up with an idea or someone shares something and they start running because it makes so much sense, but they never come back because any pastor can make anything sound like it makes sense, right? That's what we get paid to do. Make things that don't make sense, make it sound like it sense. So like anyone can make you think anything, right? And so you need to go back and say, does this line up? And that's why they're noble, right? So we want to be a church here that's under the authority of the Word of God. We're not under the authority of a pastor. We're under the authority of the Word of God, right? And so I only have as much authority as I bring you the truth about the Word. All right, so into sidebar. Now, so they're going to respond positively as this happens. So 
Uh, in the middle of verse, uh, or verse 11, the Berean Jews were a more noble character than the Thessalonica. Notice they're both Jews. Like Luke's not anti-Semitic. He's just telling the story. Some Jews open, some Jews not. Okay, so the Berean Jews were more noble than those in Thessalonica. Why? Because they received the message, and I love this, with great what? Eagerness. Eagerness. We'll come back to that later. And they examined the scriptures, what? Every day, right? So they're not just going on Sabbath and saying, well, that's interesting. Why don't you come back next week? We'll learn some more. They're like, wow, that's crazy. Can you meet tonight? Can we get, how about tomorrow? What are you doing tomorrow morning? How about, you know, breakfast at Denny's? You know, like, what are you doing? Like, five o'clock a.m. before work. Let's do it. How, how about after work? We got siesta in the afternoon. You free? Let's go to the habit. You know, I mean, they're hungry to learn. And so, as, and they're, they're checking it every day, catch this, to see if what Paul was saying was true. He's bringing a new message. It's outside their paradigm. Well, let's open the word and let's see if it matches up. And so as a result, many of them believed. Remember, catch this. Last week we talked about this. Salvation is supernatural, right? Uh, it's, a, it's a gift of God. We talked about that. And yet we said that we have a part to play. I want you to notice here is that there was one group that was open to the word, one group that not. Those who were open, that they were, they were able to receive. And so the... Uh, so it says that uh, as a result, many of them believed. Also, a lot of prominent Greek women and many Greek men, so both Jews and Gentiles. So in both places, the churches started, Thessalonica and in Berea, but more Jews in uh, Berea than Thessalonica because of their approach to the word. Now, when the Jews in Thessalonica, remember 50 miles away, uh, learned that Paul was preaching the what? The word of God. Don't miss that. In fact, back in verse 11, uh, the NIV kind of hides this, but it says the Berean Jews were more noble character than those of Thessalonica, for they received, it says the message. In the Greek, it says the word. We'll come back to today. So back in verse 13 now. So they heard that Paul was preaching the word of God at Berea. They went there too, agitating the crowd. So they sent some emissaries, and they're going to go and try to disrupt him there because they really see this message of Jesus. They don't see it as the word of God. They see it as heresy. And they want to do whatever they can to disrupt it, stop it. Much like the Apostle Paul, before he met Jesus, would travel great distance, you remember this, to, uh, to persecute Christians and arrest them and so on, because he saw it as very damaging. So they're doing the same thing. In fact, we saw this back in Acts 14. On his first trip, Paul shared Jesus in Antioch, Pisidia, and then Iconium, got kicked out of both places, went to Lystra, 100 miles away. But when the Jews from Antioch and uh, Iconium heard they traveled a hundred miles, four day journey by foot to go and they actually stoned him there. You remember that? So this is a common pattern. And so they travel 50 miles, they come and agitate. And so the believers think, hey, it's getting too hot here for Paul. His life is in danger. And so immediately, uh, verse 14, they sent him to the coast, but Silas and Timothy stayed at Berea. And so then uh, those were with him, the kind of a safety team, a security team, they escorted Paul, brought him to Athens, which was 200 miles to the south, and they left with instructions for Silas and Timothy, his teammates, to join him as soon as possible. So they get him out of town. Uh, they get him 200 miles away where he can be safe, uh, and then he's in Athens waiting for his teammates to come. Next week, we'll see what happens when Athens, when the word of God hits Athens, the center of the religious and philosophical uh, uh, heart of the Roman Empire. It's going to be awesome next week. We're going to talk about idolatry 101. I can't, can't wait. But anyway, uh, for today, message on the table today is word 101. Because what, what, what uh, scholars believe is that Luke is doing, like Luke's got an agenda as he's going through. He's not just telling stories to be telling stories. He's telling them for a reason. He's telling, like last week, he highlighted three cases of salvation in Philippi because he wants to understand when you come to Jesus, this is salvation and how that works. Well, today, that he seems to be highlighting and contrasting uh, these two cities and how they responded to the word of God. One open, one not. What happens? And he's highlighting the role that the word of God and the message of Jesus plays in our life as followers of Jesus or as not yet followers of Jesus. And so what I want to do today is I want to highlight two big picture principles. The first one's a little bit more academic. Hang with me. It's really important. Uh, two big picture principles about the word of God that flow out of this passage and then come back and ask really two hard hitting practical questions for our lives. So let's jump in. There in your note sheet. You have a section called the Word 101, listen and follow. Here's principle number one. The first thing Luke wants us to get, and this is huge. This is a big 
uh, big picture teaching of Luke that runs through all Luke and Acts, his two-volume account. He's, remember, he's writing for new believers and for people investigating the movement of Jesus. Here's the point. He wants us to understand that the message of Jesus is the word of God. Now, you may say, wait a second, isn't that obvious? Isn't that why we're here in church? I mean, isn't that what it means to be a Christ follower, that the message is the word of God? We understand that. But what I want you to catch is when Paul was going from synagogue to synagogue, this was anything but obvious. Uh, remember what I said is he would come into a city and go to the synagogue, a couple of things that the assumptions they held in common with his Jewish uh, audience. Number word, one, God has spoken. He has spoken in the past through his word. He has spoken to Moses. He's spoken to the prophets. He's spoken to, uh, through, through the writings. We have the Bible. The, the Jews of Jesus' day, the Jews of Paul's day, same Old Testament we have. Same books. Right? And they assumed that God had spoken. And Paul shared that assumption that we have the word of God. And the word of God is infallible and you can trust it. They share that assumption. They also share the assumption that God was not through speaking. That there was a final word that would come when Messiah would come and he would bring the final word of God, turn all wrongs to right, bring the kingdom of God. They shared that assumption. What was completely outside of their paradigm was that the kingdom of God would come through the suffering and the death and the resurrection of the Messiah. No one saw that coming. In first century Judaism, the concept of a crucified Messiah was an oxymoron. That's why Paul says in 1 Corinthians 1, it is a stumbling block to Jews. And so what Paul is bringing a message is completely countercultural. Completely, I saw the parents. So when he comes, he says, listen, okay, we all believe this is the word of God, right? Yes, we all believe Messiah is coming and will bring the kingdom of God, right? Yes, we all believe. Said, okay, so let me, let's do a little Bible study here. And he's gonna take them back and he's gonna open up the scriptures and he's gonna make his case that the scriptures themselves say Messiah, A, will suffer and die and rise, B, and therefore, Jesus of Nazareth, that I'm, I'm introducing you to today, is the Messiah. Now, this was not a new technique that the Apostle Paul came up with. This is the Jesus method. One of the things we'll see today is that Jesus was completely convinced that the Old Testament was the Word of God. He lived his life by it. He said it has to be fulfilled. He said that the Scripture cannot be broken. He said, everything that's written in the law will be fulfilled. For Jesus, the writings of Moses and, the, and the, the prophets and the writings, that they are the infallible word of God. And we see that today in Luke 24. Remember, Luke writes two volumes, Luke and Acts. At the final volume of Luke 24, on the day that Jesus resurrects, he meets with his disciples in the upper room. You remember that? Uh, it's, it's at night, they're afraid, they've been hiding for three days. Jesus shows up behind locked doors. So he's got a real body, it's physical, but it's got new capabilities, it's like 2.0. And so he shows up, and they're freaked out, they think he's a ghost, I'm not a ghost. Look at my hands, look at my feet, um, touch me, uh, do you have something to eat? I shared dinner together. So he's real, the resurrection's real, blows their mind, they weren't expecting that. And so then he says, let's do a Bible study because what's happening before your eyes is what had to happen. It's what the Bible said would happen, therefore it has to happen. And so he says, if you look there on your note sheet, he says, this is what I was trying to tell you when I was still with you, you know, before I was arrested and executed. He said, everything, catch this, must be fulfilled. If it's in the word, it's got to be fulfilled. God always keeps his promises. So everything must be fulfilled, that it's written about me, in other words, the Messiah, in this threefold division, the Old Testament, the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. And then he catches, he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. Up to that point, no one got it. Up to that point, it was hidden. But he opens their mind to say, look what the scriptures say. Yes, and I'm sure they do a huge Bible study. Yes, 
uh, yes, uh, Moses said that a, a prophet greater than him would come in Deuteronomy 18. And yes, David said in Psalm 2 that the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand. And yes, there's these amazing prophecies about the rule of the Messiah. He says, but let's also look at Isaiah 53 about the Lamb of God, the, what, the servant of God who is rejected, not recognized, rejected by his own people who would die for the sins of the nation. But when he dies, that he's he will once again see the light of life. And so he takes them through the prophecies. And he opens their mind. Interesting, the same ver- uh, word here in Greek that he opened their minds, same word that Paul, uh, Luke uses today when he says that Paul opened the scriptures in Thessalonica. So Paul is doing the same thing. So, so Jesus goes on, he says, he told them, this is what is written, the Christ, remember that means Messiah, the Messiah will suffer and he'll rise from the dead on the third day and repentance and forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. And so this is what Paul is doing. He's doing the Jesus thing. He's opening up the scripture. If A A equals B and B equals C, A equals C. But what Luke wants us to understand as his readers is Paul is not just laying this out for the Thessalonians. He's laying it out for us. Luke wants us to understand this story that God is writing, this novel that God is writing, this word that God is writing through Moses and the prophets and the writings, that the final chapters have now been written and their name are Jesus. The name name of these chapters is Jesus. And, And so for Luke, the message of Jesus is the word of God. And when you open his writings, you see it all the way through. This is one of his big claims. For example, look on your note sheet in Luke chapter 1. This is how he starts his two-volume set. He says to Theophilus, remember he's writing to them, many have undertaken to drop an account of the things that have been fulfilled. Catch that word. They've been what? Fulfilled. It's a language of fulfillment. He says, there are many authors who have taken up to draw an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us, the life, death, resurrection of Jesus' movement. He said, just as they were handed down to us, by those who were from the first eyewitnesses, you know, the apostles, and servants of the what? Notice that. He's talking about the first apostles. He says they're eyewitnesses and they're servants of what? The word. Now, you expect him to say servants of the Lord, servants of Jesus. He doesn't say servants of the word. For Luke, the word of God, it's almost personified. And we're going to see this in Acts. He's going to describe the word as as it's alive, it's active, it's growing, it's expanding. It's almost like you see a globe and the word is just like expanding and growing over the globe, taking over the world. In fact, if you look in your note sheet, let's run through some verses in Acts that I've kind of moved over more rapidly as we've gone through these chapters, but they'll make more sense now. In chapter 6, the early church in Jerusalem still, so the word of God spread and the number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly. The word is spreading over the globe. Look at the next part. When the, when the message of Jesus first goes outside of the Jews to the first Samaritans, look at the next passage. When the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had accepted the word of God. They didn't say accepted Jesus. They accepted the word. Okay? Look at the next. Uh, in Acts 11, when the, disciple, when the message first goes to Gentiles, it says the apostles and the brothers throughout Judea heard that Gentiles had received what? The word, not the Messiah, the word. You go to Acts 12. After the death of James, he's beheaded. Paul's, uh, Peter's in prison. Then Herod is struck dead. It says, but the word of God continued to increase and spread. You get to Acts 13. When Paul shares on his first missionary journey in Antioch of Pisidia, when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and they honored the word. When you go to Acts 15, Paul's ready to take Barnabas on their second journey. He says, let's go back and visit the the brothers in all the towns where we preach the word. And you see it today. Look at Acts, take your Bibles out. Acts 11, 17, 11. The Berean Jews were more noble than those of Thessalonica, for they received in the Greek the word. Go to Acts 13. The difference is with the Jews in Thessalonica, when they heard that Paul was preaching the word, they came, are are you understanding this? Luke wants us to understand he's making a claim that for many of us, we've already accepted, but he's making a claim that the message of Jesus is the final word of God. 
The God who spoke through Abraham, the God who spoke through Moses, the God who spoke through the prophets, Jeremiah and Isaiah and Ezekiel, the God who has spoken through the Psalms and through David, God has spoken again, and his final word is in his son. The message of Jesus is the final word of God. Now, this leads to number two then. And number two is that our response In other words, our response to this word about Jesus, our response determines our destiny. What Luke wants us to understand, hey, this message of Jesus, I'm telling you, this is not like a take it or leave it thing. I'm not just doing like a historical study of Jesus. Isn't that interesting? He says, what I'm bringing to you is the living and abiding word of God, and your destiny depends on what you do with it. It, Your destiny determines depends on your response to the word of God that's been revealed in Jesus Christ. And men and women, here's the thing. What what he's doing is he's contrasting, look, hey, the Jews in Thessalonica, they weren't open to the word. The Jews in Berea were open to the word. What about you? Now, here's what I want you to catch. If you're not a follower of Jesus yet, this is the claim. God has spoken, what are you going to do? Are you like the Jews of Thessalonica that reject the word? Are you like the Jews of Berea that receive the word and receive light? But for all of us, most of us here, probably given our life to Jesus, we'd say, I have received the word. What I want you to catch is that our response to the living and abiding word of God in our life, it not only determines our ultimate destiny, it determines our intermediate destinies. In other words, your life, your freedom, your health, your growth, your impact is directly proportionate to your openness to the word. You want to grow? You want to thrive? You want to experience freedom? You want to be used? You want to make a difference? Directly proportionate to your openness to the word in your life. Now, Jesus talks about this. In John chapter 8, one of my favorite passages Jesus does his own A, B, you know, if A equal B, C, and B, C thing, but it's a little different equation. But powerful. I put it in the New American Standard simply because it's the most literal translation, and and I need that here. But Jesus, uh, he's talking to some Jews who have come to a certain level of faith. They believed him at a certain level. And he says, Jesus, therefore, was saying to those Jews who had believed in him, he said, if you abide in my word. Now, I want to break that down for you. If you abide in my what? Word, Word, okay? So if you abide. Let's talk about the word abide. The word in Greek is the word meno, M-E-N-O. And it means to remain. It means to stick with. It means to follow. So Jesus says to these new believers, he says, if you abide, stick with, listen and follow, receive and live out. If you do that, he says, then you are truly what? Disciples of mine. Okay, so we've learned in Acts, disciple, the common word for a Jesus follower, right? He says, okay, so how do you know if you're truly a Jesus follower? How do you know if you're a Christ follower? Jesus says, it's very simple. Do you Follow my word. (laughs) All right? He says, I didn't ask you, did you like my word on Facebook? (laughs) I didn't ask you if you are a fan of my word. I asked you, are you following my word? He said, because if you're following my word, you're my disciple. If you're not following you're living in la-la land. You are self-deceived. You may call yourself a believer. You say you're a Christian. You may go to church. You may love to worship. You may say, isn't that an awesome message? You may go to your life group. Can you believe it? That was powerful. But Jesus said the only test is what you follow and you do my word. Okay, so he goes on. He says, so, 
If you abide in my word, you listen, you follow. He said, then what that means is you're truly a disciple. He says, and if you're truly a disciple, here's what's going to happen. He said, you will know the truth. He says that if you're truly under my leadership and you're surrendered to my leadership, what's going to happen is like truth is going to begin to break into your life. Like, like light behind a, a dark cloud. And he said, when that happens, you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Do you see the sequence? The sequence is if you abide, you listen, you follow, then you will know the truth, B, and then C, the truth will set you free. If you don't, if you're just a fan, if you just like it, if you just praise it, none of this sequence happens. There's no freedom. Man, what can I tell you? There are people in churches all over our country today that have never been transformed. They have never been set free. They're the same person they were a long time ago. They go to church every week. In fact, they are just maybe even creepier than they were. (laughs) They're just like more religious, and they're more judgmental, and they're more creepy, and they're more hypocritical. Oh, but they're good on Facebook. Hey, where's our nation going? This is what the word says. I'm like, dude, you're less like Jesus now than you were 10 years ago. Like, where's the love? Where's the forgiveness? Where's the hope? Where's the courage? Where's the gentleness? Where's the peace? Like, where's the compassion? Like, you're not like Jesus, and yet, oh, I like the word. No, no. You like the word. You've not listened to the word. And you are not experiencing the freedom. You are not transformed. Your life is just a big mess or messier now. Jesus said the truth, the, the word, is our path to life. It's a power to set us free. It determines our destiny. So that leads to a couple questions then. So there you know, sheet. Let's get practical now. Uh, the word 101, what's your response? I have two questions for you, and I'm going to push hard on this, all right? So you're going to get very uncomfortable. Welcome to church. All right. So... <laughs> Uh, number one, um, here's a question, great question, one of the most important questions in life for us to ask, one we often don't ask, or if we do, we lie to ourselves. But it goes like this, what is your ultimate authority? In your life, what's your ultimate authority? Why do you do what you do? What do why do you believe what you believe? If I were to ask you, What's the bottom line authority in your life? Why do you believe what you believe? What, do you, what would you say? Here's the interesting thing. For the Jews in Thessalonica, ironically, they would have said the word of God. If you would have said, why are you chasing Paul 50 miles away and trying to kill him? They would have said the word of God. If you said, what's your ultimate authority for what you believe, what you do? The word, it's the Torah. It's the law of Moses, it's the prophets, it's the writings. And yet, when the word of God came, they rejected it. And you know why they rejected it? Because it didn't fit their paradigm. And their paradigm, Messiahs don't die, Messiahs kick butt. A crucified Messiah is an oxymoron. And so we're not buying it. And by the way, if you buy into a crucified Messiah, you may end up living a crucified life. And so sure enough, three months later after Paul leaves, he writes a letter back to the Thessalonians and guess what the Christian, the Jewish who bought in, guess what was happening? They're being persecuted. You follow a crucified Messiah, you're signing up for persecution. And so there were a lot of reasons, lifestyle reasons, theological reasons, social reasons, why they didn't want to buy it. They didn't want to look at the evidence. They weren't opening their Bibles and saying, here's this new teaching. Is it true? Let's open it up and see. They weren't even opening. But if you asked them, what's your ultimate authority? They would have said the word of God. And this happens in our lives all the time. The reality is we don't know what our ultimate authority is until the word of God rubs against 
our paradigms. We don't really know what we believe about the Word of God until it asks us to do something that's hard that we don't want to do. We don't know what our ultimate authority is until it challenges us away and we don't want to be challenged. And that's when we find out, is it really the Word of God? And are we really open to hear from God or are we not? You know, about 15 years later after this event, remember Paul was there with Timothy, and about 15 years later, Timothy has become the Bishop of Ephesus. Ephesus, maybe third or fourth largest city in the Roman Empire. And Paul is going to have a great ministry there. And 15 years later, Timothy is going to be the lead kind of bishop over the whole city, right? And so Paul is going to write a letter to Timothy and to the church. We call it the letter of 2 Timothy. It's towards the end of Paul's life. And this is what he says. Some of you are familiar with this, some not. But in 2 Timothy chapter 3, this is what he says. He says, Timothy, I remember Timothy, we learned earlier in Acts, he was, uh, his mother was a Jew, grandmother was a Jew, but his father was a Gentile, not a believer. So Timothy was raised with the word of God from his mother and grandmother. And so Paul's referring to that. He said, from infancy, you have known the holy scriptures. Uh, he's referring here to the Old Testament, 24 books that we have, you know, writings, Moses, uh, prophets. And he said, they're able to make you wise for salvation. Through Christ Jesus, through Messiah Jesus. So he says they don't always lead people to salvation because like the Thessalonians, they weren't open. But they're able to if you're open. And he says all scripture, catch that, no exceptions, all scripture, uh, again, talking about the Hebrew Old Testament here, I think the principle applies to our New Testament, but here, you know, it hasn't, the New Testament, he's writing it as he he writes this, right? He says uh, all scripture, it's God breathed. In other words, it's supernatural. The God who spoke creation into existence through his word, that God breathed his word through Moses, through the prophets, through the writings, so that the end result is both the word of God and the word of man, just like Jesus. It comes in Jeremiah, it sounds different than Isaiah, it sounds it's not like dictated. It's coming through their unique personalities, but the Holy Spirit's breathing, so the end result is the word of God. He says, as God breathed, and he says it's useful in our life for four things. His first thing is teaching. The word of God teaches us kind of the path to life. Secondly, he says it's, it's, it's great for rebuke. When we're out of line, it warns us, don't go there, Will Rogers. Right? Uh, third one, uh, he says it's good for correcting. Think like a coach. Hey, not just your right hand, your left hand. It's correct. It's, and it's good for training in righteousness. In other words, here's the right path, you know, and so like a spiritual trainer would train us in the path of life. And he goes on and he says, that, 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 so that, uh, that the, the man of God, remember he's writing to Timothy, the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. And so what do we learn in Ephesians? We've been chosen before time to come to Jesus, to be adopted in his family, forgiven, filled with his spirit. We become part of his epic plan to bring all of creation under the leadership of his true king. Uh, we all have a role to play. We have all have works chosen for us before time began. And that this word is going to equip us to carry out our assignments in life. Um, It's interesting. um, Remember, after Paul left Thessalonica, three months later, he writes back the letter of 1 Thessalonians. Look what he says there on your note sheet. He says, we also thank God continually because when you receive the what? The word of God. So remember, the message of Jesus is the word of God. You You heard from us. You accepted it not as the word of men, but as it actually is the word of God. And catch this, which is at work, present tense, in you who believe. Remember what, what the writer of the Hebrews says, chapter, the word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword. And he says that the word of God that spoke, crea- when God speaks, things happen. He created the universe through his word. And Isaiah 55, the prophet said, even as the rain and the snow come down from heaven and cause the earth to bud and to bring forth fruit, so shall my word that I speak, it will cause to happen the purposes for which I sent it forth. When Jesus came, his name was the word. When God speaks, things happen. And when God wants to work in your life and my life, he works through his word. When you come here and the word is being taught 
and you feel like God is speaking directly to you, the word is at work in your life. When you're reading on your own and things are coming together and understanding is coming together and wisdom is coming in your life, the word is at work in your life. When you've been praying for an answer for this or that and you're reading in the scripture and a verse comes off the page and you know at once what God is saying to you, he's answering you, the word is at work in your life. Now what's interesting about this phrase here, it says the word is at work in you. This word for at work is the same word we learned last week in Philippians 2. You mean in Philippians 2, verse 12, Paul said, for it is God who's at work within you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. You remember that? And that God that's at work within you, I said, was the Greek word, energeo, that he's energizing you, same work, same word. He said, it is the, the word of God that is energizing you right now. See, as followers of Jesus, we live on the word of God. He speaks, we come to life. Have you not experienced this? Have you not been discouraged? And the word, whether it's being taught or it's a podcast or you're in a Bible, and there's a word that comes and speaks life into you? I can't even begin to tell you how many times in my life when God has spoken through his word and it fills me up and it empowers me, it brings me alive. The word of God is alive. And it is empowers us. It's at work. So the question then is, what is your final authority? We've seen what it was for Jesus, his final authority. The word must be fulfilled. We've seen for Luke, the message of Jesus is the word of God. We've seen for Paul, all scripture is inspired by God. God breathed. We've seen for Timothy. The question is, what is the word of God for you? And what I'm suggesting is we don't know the answer until the word of God collides with our paradigms. We don't know the answer until the word of God collides with our lifestyle. And when the word of God comes and speaks to you about your marriage and it demands change, when the word comes and talks to you about your racism and it challenges your views, When the word of God comes and challenges your worship of money, it demands change. When the word of God comes and talks to you about your harshness, it demands change or about courage. When the word of God comes and challenges your paradigms, what you've been taught in church your whole life, and it's completely different, but it's challenged you, the question is, what do you do? Do you hold on to the word? Do you open the word? Do you say, what does the word say? And then submit your life to the word? Or do you say, no, this is what I believe. Get out of here. Go to the next town. You see, we don't know until we're challenged whether we truly believe the word is the word or not. We often believe it's the word. I ask you, are you a follower of Jesus? Yes. Do you believe the Bible is the word of God? Yes. But the answer to that question is honestly only answered in your life, not by your words. Let me give you a very current example that you're going to be able to relate to right away. We live in the midst of a culture right now that's going crazy when it comes to sexuality. If you would have told us 15 years ago what we've seen in the last two years, we would have gone, no, no way. There's just no way. And we have have stood world history on its head. We got a Supreme Court that has said, you know what? There's five of us here that think we're smarter than the whole history of the world. Five, four vote. In fact, we not only think we're right, we're going to make ourselves right. We're going to decree. We live in the midst of a culture that believes two things about sexuality right now, and this message is coming at us hard and fast every day of our lives. Here's the two messages. Number one, sexual fulfillment is the key to life fulfillment. You cannot be fulfilled without sexual fulfillment. It's just that high on the list. Let alone Jesus wasn't married, but, you know, he just didn't know. Number two is that all sex is good sex, unless, very, and maybe some couple exceptions, but usually involving children. Right? So, so that's our two beliefs. As long as two adults, 
are, have a mutual consensual relationship, all sex is good sex, as long as it leads to personal fulfillment, okay? That's what our culture. Now, when you come to the word, we have a different story told, don't we? Very consistent. New Testament, Old Testament, very consistent. And what the Bible says is that sex is a great gift. It's given to unite one man and one woman for a lifetime of love and commitment, what we call marriage, catch us, not just for their personal fulfillment, but to create a safe environment so the most vulnerable of all human beings, children, can be raised with a mom and a dad who loves them and needs input from both. Now, that's what this says. Okay? Now, you've got a culture that's surrounding you from every angle, every day of the week, and saying, that is not true. This is not true. This is true. And the question is, when you are making this decision in your mind of what you believe about human sexuality, what is your ultimate authority? Is your authority the word, or is it your mother, or your sister, or your professor, or the media, or the Supreme Court, like, what is your authority? Catch this, this question is much bigger than a sexuality question. This issue is an authority question. What do you believe? Second question. Got very quiet in here. <laughs> Number two. The second question is, is the word a priority? You know, it's one thing to say, yeah, I believe the Bible is the word of God. I believe that God has spoken. I believe he spoke through Moses and the prophets and the Psalms, and I believe he's spoken today. I think he spoke through Jesus and the apostles, we call our New Testament, and we, we believe that. And so we believe that the Bible is the word of God. We believe it's for training. We believe it's correction. We believe it's for rebuke. We believe it's for training in righteousness. We believe that it, is, it will lead us to the truth, and the truth will set us free. We believe it's the, the bread of life that we feed on. But the question is, if I were to look at your schedule and your priorities, would your life say that you believe it's the word of God? Because if we say that God has spoken, and yet it's not a priority in our life to listen, what is that really saying? You know, Jesus said something very interesting. He said something uh, in Matthew chapter 4 during his temptation. He's quoting Deuteronomy 8. But he said, uh, he said, man does not live by bread alone. In other words, life is more than physical. But he lives by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Jesus is telling you his approach to life, that he lives off the words of his Father. You know, one of the signs of physical health is appetite. Like if you have young kids or teenagers, I know we complain about this, but when they're eating us out of house and home, you're taking out a second mortgage, they know you by name at Costco, you know, you're doing home deliveries from Costco on the pallet. Uh, we may complain, but that's a good thing, isn't it? Because we know that when our kids are eating a lot, what do we say? We say they're going through a growth phase. When you're hungry, it shows you're growing. And what does Jesus say? The same thing spiritually. When you're hungry for the word, it's a sign of health. You're growing. What does it say when you've lost your appetite? Uh... Your kid hasn't eaten for three days, not hungry. You're probably going to be hitting urgent care. Something's not right. This is not right. My child is not hungry. And we're not hungry for the word of God. Something is wrong. It's not normal. Something has gone wrong. What I love about these Bereans, check this out, 17, chapter 17, and verse 11. They're hungry. 
The Berean Jews were more noble character than those of Thessalonica, for they received the message with great what? Oh, my gosh. <laughs> Talk about oxymoron. With great eagerness. Uh, yeah, they're, they're so excited. Uh, okay, they received the message with great eagerness. They're hungry. And how do you know? Because they examine the scriptures every day. They still got to go to work, but it's like, it's not Sabbath anymore, but they're like, hey, Paul, could we meet before work? Hey, during the middle of the afternoon, when everyone's taking a siesta, could we meet at the school of Tyrannus in Ephesus? And can we like rent out that place? And can we learn like every day? Hey, can we meet with you at night uh, after the work day? We're just hungry. Hey, this is a good sight. And so the question is, how hungry are you for the word? One of the signs of a growing believer, they're hungry. They, they want to be a church. At least if they're at a church where the word's being taught. They, they, they want to be a church. And when it comes time to, to teach the word, they got the Bibles out. They got their apps open. If they're a note taker, they'll be taking no, They're hungry. And I want to learn. They're sitting on the edges. God, what do you have for me today? They don't come to church just like, okay, well, how long is it going to be? They're coming in. And they're like, man, what am I going to learn today? They're coming in with a prayer on their lips going, Jesus, what do you want to say to me today? And their Bible's not going to go dusty during the week. They're going to time when they get their app, I get the Bible. They're going to spend some time. They're going to spend some time alone. And there's so many ways to take in the Word. We're all wired differently. Maybe you're not like a, a reader, but you're an audible listener. So you listen to, to you version being read to you. Or you get the Bible on tape. Or maybe you study. Maybe you learn best when you're in an organized, intentional Bible study like CBS or uh, or, or Bible study fellowship, or something like that, or a, a, a course online, or maybe you get together with three friends. You find this is the way I learn best. Or maybe you take the course we talk about here, one of our first essential course, Pursuing God. We talk about different ways to study the word that match your personality that work for you. But you have found a way. I mean, we live in a day and age of unprecedented access to the word. You, you pick up your, your phone, right, and you got you version, you got like 82 versions, right? Chinese, if you want it. I pick up my phone. I got all my versions. I got Greek. I got Hebrew. It's like awesome. And so in a day and an age where the knowledge of the Lord covers the earth like the waters cover the sea, we have so much access. How hungry are we? I want you to ponder that. I want you to think about that. I'm going to ask the worship team to come out right now. And they're going to sing a song for us. And we're just going to wash over you. Uh, I just want to give you some time to reflect on this. And just be with the Lord. Hey, if you're not hungry, something is wrong. And so you need to have a discussion with Jesus, the word of God, the living word of God, and say, what is it that's keeping me from growing in my hunger? Because I, I, I don't want to be one of those Christians that's rejecting your word. I want it to be my ultimate authority. I want to feed off of that richly.